on to a very uh, difficult and challenging subject tonight, dealing with if God exists, why is there suffering? I might expand the title to say if God is love, why is there so much suffering? Why do the innocent suffer? If God's all-powerful, why doesn't He destroy the devil? There's a lot of whys and a lot of dear people and brilliant people when they ask this question because they don't understand what the Bible teaches on this, they throw aside God altogether. They say, how could there be a good God in a world where there's so much bad? Granted, there's much good in the world, but we all see that there's needless suffering and innocent suffering at the hands of the wicked. Why does God allow this? How many of you have asked this question before? You've thought these things. Well, begin with an amazing fact that will lead into our subject today about flying serpents. I've got a friend who is a, a Christian illustrator, very talented artist, and he's traveled the world and he documents history of various civilizations around the world. And one intriguing thing that he's found is all over the world, the cultures all over the world, including I believe the aboriginal cultures here in Australia, have legends of flying dragons. Have you heard this before? Have you seen it? I mean, it's not just the flying dragons you see portrayed in China. They had them in North America. Just about every culture has these legends and stories of flying serpents or dragons. And you know, it's interesting. You can even go to uh, Borneo, and they've got a lizard uh, snake there that'll jump out of the trees. He flattens out his rib cage, and he can glide somewhat from tree to tree. And of course, uh, the paleontologists that do research and dig up some of these ancient bones, they find a lot of evidence of these flying reptiles that uh, ostensibly lived a long time ago. Uh, maybe I'll talk more about that another night. But some have wondered, maybe this is what gives rise to the, the legends all around the world. Or could it be something even more simple? You know, in the Bible, it talks about a serpent that was grounded because of bad behavior. It's interesting, in Revelation chapter 3, you find a very interesting drama playing out between a woman and a child and a dragon, a serpent. And you get to Revelation chapter 12, you find that in Genesis 3, you get to Revelation chapter 12, and again you find this conflict between the serpent and the woman, and there's a child there. And it goes from beginning to end in the Bible. There is a battle between God, the devil, and the woman. What did we learn a woman represents? The bride of Christ or God's people, the believers. Yeah, I also think it's interesting that if you look at snakes, now I know the ladies are going to love this picture. If you look carefully, uh, serpents, not all of them, but many of them have a couple of bones that come out. They're, they're like ribs that stick out of the skin. Uh, the zoologists call them vestigial remnants. And it appears that at one time they had some kind of limbs, or some have even hypothesized wings. Where'd they come from? Well, the Bible seems to address this too, but stay with me. We're going to again go to our first question for this presentation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why is there sin and suffering? Why is there evil? Why would a good God make a bad devil? Big questions. Number one, with whom did sin or evil originate? According to the Bible, if you look in John chapter 3 verse 8, it says, the devil sinneth from the beginning. Sin in the world and suffering in the world originated with this arch villain that we sometimes call Satan or the devil. He comes by many names. Virtually every religion in the world has a God of good, and then they've got this sinister, evil God, because everyone can see it acting out in life. You see these beautiful things of creation, butterflies coming out of their cocoons, and just wonderful things of great beauty. And then we see things that are vicious. You, you see a, you know, an innocent little fawn being torn apart by a lion, and you say, wow, that just doesn't look right. There's such ferocity and, and brutality in, in the world. It, was that the original plan? You read in Genesis, when God made everything, it says, it was good, good, and he concludes by saying, very good. Something happened. Stay with me. Again, he's called that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. You go to Revelation, 
And uh, right there it identifies this, and by the way, in that same verse it calls him the dragon. The dragon, the serpent, Satan, the devil. And so in the Bible you'll hear references to the dragon and to the serpent, and they are typically symbolic of the devil because he sort of got branded with that logo at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Number two, what was Satan's name before he sinned, and where was he living at that time? Well, if you read in Isaiah 14, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, the name Satan means adversary. He wasn't always an adversary. God did not make an evil devil because that would make God an accomplice for evil and sin. And the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. God doesn't do anything wrong. He's perfect. And there's no evil that proceeds from God. If evil proceeds from God, then why would he punish sinners for being evil? This is so important that we understand this. It'll change your whole world view. Stay with me. Number three. Oh, by the way, I thought it was very interesting. The word Lucifer is not a bad name. It means light bearer or the morning star, the one who brings the light. And you've probably heard of luminescence or lucite, and these are words that have to do with light. I remember one day I was washing my clothes. I was doing a meeting like this, and I went to the laundromat, is what you call it, you know, the public laundry, and I was washing my clothes, and I'm just sitting there watching them dry, and it gets pretty boring. And I looked at the, um, there's a boy there, you know, and, and uh, he, his mother was off folding clothes, and he was right in front of me playing with some little toy cars on the linoleum, the, the floor there. And so I was sitting there, and I said, hi, how you doing? I'm doing okay. He said, so what's your name? He didn't even look up. He said, Lucifer. I said, what? He said, Lucifer. I said, I suppose your folks don't go to church. <laughs> I don't think I said that, but I thought that. <laughs> well, what a thing to do, name your kid Lucifer. But it's not a bad name. Not too many people name their kid like Satan. I mean, but uh, Lucifer, because it was the original label of the devil, uh, you know, kind of scary thought. Anyway, number three. Sounds like a good name for like a mean dog. <laughs> number three. What was the origin? Oh, wait, wait a second. I want to go back to that last one. How thou art fallen from heaven. Where did he come from? God had a devil in heaven? Okay, let's keep going here. Number three. What was the origin of Lucifer's responsible position? Oh, I'm sorry. What was the origin of Lucifer and what responsible position did he hold? And how much does the Bible describe him? Well, it tells us in Ezekiel 28, speaking about the origin of Lucifer, you were perfect in your ways. So did God make a defective devil? You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. He wasn't born. He was created. You and I are all born, but there are certain beings that are created. Adam was created. God created Eve. Angels are created. They don't have children and procreate. Lucifer was created long, long time ago. And when God made him, he was perfect. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. You know, the Bible speaks of some mysteries, and one mystery is the mystery of iniquity. It also speaks about the mystery of godliness in the Bible. A lot of people have speculated, where does the virus AIDS come from, the HIV virus? And I've heard all kinds of crazy things that it was a communist plot or the, some other country developed in a lab to destroy people. And, and others have said, oh, it came from green monkeys in Africa. And they don't really know. I mean, where does any germ originate or mutate? And so some of these things are a mystery. But we actually can learn more about what happened in the Bible. It's not a total mystery. It goes on to tell us about his position. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now, if you read in the Bible, you've probably heard about the Ark of the Covenant, the sacred object that was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And above the Ark, there were two angels. They're called covering cherubs. It's the highest position. It represents the throne of God, that Ark on earth. And in heaven, God does not have golden angels on the right and left of his throne. He's got real angels. The golden angels on the ark were symbols of the real angels by the throne of God. 
Lucifer held one of those positions. Highest position of any created being was the position of one of those angels. He was perfect. He loved God. He was free. All the other angels worshipped him as their commander. Even the angels have varying ranks. They're organized. And something went wrong. He rebelled. Now, when I say to you, I want you to picture the devil. <laughs> I know that sounds scary, but work with me. If you were to close your eyes for a minute and picture the devil. Okay, you can open your eyes now. On your mental screen, what kind of image just popped up? How many saw somewhere in the picture some red? <laughs> Did anybody have any horns in their picture? How about a goatee? You know, I once grew a goatee to compensate. And people said, then I looked like a sinister minister. And so I thought, that won't work for my line. <laughs> so I shaved it off. But usually people see something like this, right, when they think of the devil. They see some, you know, hideous monster, and he's got bat wings, and he's got red leotards. Why, I don't know. Part-time trapeze work or something. I don't know. And he, he's um, got a pointed tail and a black cape and the horns and will someone help me where are the verses that describe the devil that way There's nothing in the Bible that all comes from mythology and yet that's typically the person's picture and uh, folks love to minimalize they say that's just a joke and they tease and say what are you gonna have for dessert I'll have devil's food cake ah. you know and, and people they're not even afraid of it and or they got red devil paint and and uh, everyone's got this cartoon concept of what Satan looks like. That is exactly what the devil wants you to think. He is not a hideous monster, neither is he a cute cartoon. You know, a little red devil on one shoulder telling you to do the wrong thing, and you get the little angel with a halo on the other shoulder telling you to do the right thing, and we've got these things sort of burned in our, in our minds. I want you to try to divorce yourself from those pictures and realize that the, the devil, Lucifer, was the most beautiful of God's creation. Question number four. What led to Lucifer's sin, his rebellion? It says in Ezekiel 28, as we read on in the same passage, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. You know, you've heard it said before that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because of his exalted position and incredible powers, the Bible says angels are more powerful than men. You read that in Hebrews. Man was made a little lower than the angels, it tells us in Psalms. He is the chief of the angels, incredibly powerful being. And you and I in our own strength are no match for the devil. But always remember that you and Jesus are a majority. You and Jesus can bring down any giants. You don't need to be afraid of the devil if you're with Christ, because Christ defeats the devil every time. But here he was, this powerful angel, worshipped by the other angels, brilliant, good-looking, and because of his gifts, he began to worship himself instead of God. Now, you might be thinking, well, did God make a mistake? Obviously, the wiring was wrong at the factory. If, if this one angel started worshiping himself, didn't, didn't God do something wrong? Couldn't God have made him where he never would think those proud, selfish thoughts? Yeah, God could have made him like that, but can you love if you're a robot? Let me ask you another question. If God makes all of his creatures free to love, if he pre-programs his creatures to love, is that love? Let me illustrate just a second. See, this sometimes doesn't work. We'll see if it works here. No, I'm not going to pull the devil out of my pocket. Okay. <laughs> Little recording device here. It's mine. See, is it on? Hold it up here where you can hear. Hello, Doug. Hello, recording device. I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very well, thank you. My batteries are fully charged. I'm glad to hear that. Doug? Yes, tape player? I want to tell you something important. We're all listening. I love you, Doug. Oh, you are thanks. so kind and good. 
and clever and just all round wonderful, not to mention you're tall and dark and handsome, and I love the way that your eyes sparkle and your head shines. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. Doug, I love you. I love you. I love you. No, no. I love you. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. Doug, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Doug. Doug, I love you. 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 Doug, I love you. You're a sweetie pie. I love you. I always like doing that. <laughs> Can you tell? Oh, I feel much better. You know, we all want love, and now I'm satisfied. <laughs> Will that work? Hey, we could make a lot of money if people all want love. Does everyone here want love? If we just tell ourselves whatever you want to hear, put it on a tape player, and read it back to yourself. You can just praise yourself. Some people do that in their conversations anyway, don't they? <laughs> but is that love? Will that satisfy? No, because I made it say it. It's just repeating what I told it to say. You think God wants to get that kind of love from his creatures? If God made his creatures so they're pre-programmed where they have to say, I love you, God, I love you, God, is that love? Forced love, there's another word for it, it's called rape. God doesn't force any of his creatures to love him. He made Lucifer and all of his creatures with freedom intelligence, a free will. They could choose to process the information with the minds and the intelligence they have and draw their own conclusions. He can only hope that they'll love him, but he doesn't force us to love him. You know, when God makes his creatures, he takes a risk that some of them might choose not to love him. Some of them might choose to rebel. You take the same risk, many of you. Question, how many of you have children? Come on, fess up. How many of you, assuming you chose to have children, when you chose to have children, you received a written guarantee from the doctor that they'd always be cooperative and obedient? <laughs> How many of you chose to have ch children knowing that there was the very real possibility they might not love you back? Oh, no, no, of course they'll love me. I'm so lovable. That's what you were thinking, right? <laughs> or they might disobey. Were you all aware of that? And you still had them? And people shake their fist at God and say, if you're God and you're all powerful, why didn't you just make Lucifer love you? That's not love. God doesn't operate that way. So this highest of the angels rebelled. Now, I'm not quite done with some of the verses on this subject, so let me catch up real quick. It says in Isaiah 14, verse 13, For you have said in your heart, I will be like the Most High. He began to be jealous of the power and position of God. And he wanted to just basically take Christ from his throne and take the position of God. Question number five. What happened in heaven as a consequence of Lucifer's rebellion? It tells us, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Now here's something that we know right away is that Lucifer, Satan, is now not alone in his rebellion. You notice there it says the dragon and his what? His angels. That means that when Lucifer first began to nurture these rebellious thoughts because he was so in love with himself and his looks and, and his intelligence, he thought, I should be God. I will be like the Most High. He is the ultimate megalomaniac, narcissistic, and that's acted out in the lives of some who follow him. He began to circulate among the other angels and with his incredible intelligence and his political skill, he began to say, you know, why does God have rules? Why does God have a law? We should have more freedom. We, we, don't, we should have no restrictions. And he began to question the government and the leadership of God on every point, but he would do it subtly, by innuendo. You've seen people do that before. They'll try to besmirch your character by planting questions. And the devil's a master at that. And he went among the angels and he began to insinuate among the angels that God is not good, that God is not fair, that if he was God, things would be much better. And he managed somehow, according to the Bible, it says one-third of the angels sided with Lucifer in his rebellion. Can you imagine that? And so ultimately it broke out in some 
cosmic conflict there in heaven between God and his angels and the devil and his angels and of course it uses a, a symbolic word it calls him the dragon but we all know who that is until finally they are evicted I don't know what weapons they use but there was some kind of titanic colossal combat between these spiritual forces and that war is still going on today except this planet is now the battleground how did it all get transferred down here well, we'll get to that now where is Satan's present headquarters? You can find the answer for that in Revelation chapter 12. After this war in heaven, it says his tail, the tail of a dragon, maybe that's where they get the devil's got a pointed tail, you know, a little arrow on the back. And you know, he's got a pitchfork. How many of you pictured the devil with a pitchfork? And he uses that, as, you know, some people think he's in charge of hell and he wants to make sure the sinners are all fried evenly on both sides and flips them. I don't know what he does with, it's actually more like a trident and that comes from Nautilus, Greek mythology, none of that's in the Bible. Or maybe you've heard about Pluto, the god of Hades, that is in Greek mythology. A lot of modern concepts about the devil come from Greek mythology. They're not in the Bible. So he's cast out, and it says, the tail of this dragon drew a third part of the stars. Those are the angels. Revelation chapter 1 and 2 tells you the angels are the stars of these angels. And did cast them to the earth. And so the rebellion now is being carried out on this planet. It says, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, if that's clear, let me hear you just say amen. Just try it. I know it's a religious phrase, but I just want to know if you hear that. It says, the devil and his fallen angels have been cast out to this earth. You might be thinking of all the universe and it's very big. Why here? Well, the Bible answers that as well. Job chapter 1 verse 7 in this meeting where this heavenly meeting takes place you can read about in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2 God is meeting with other unfallen intelligences and the devil shows up at this meeting and God says to Satan where did you come from and he said I have come from the earth from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it and by the way I could answer you very quickly about why there's suffering in the world today without leaving the book of Job. Job chapter 1, the devil went from the presence of the Lord and he's the one that smote Job with sickness and boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. It says the devil went from the presence of the Lord and he brought a tornado or a hurricane that knocked down the house that killed Job's children. The devil went from the presence of the Lord and he destroyed the economy of Job and wiped out all of his, his increase. It says that the devil went from the presence of the Lord and the devil brought fire down from God and burnt up his flocks and yet the people said, oh, it must have been the fire of God. Job tells you it's the devil that does it but the people blame God. You know, uh, I don't know if you have this here, but on the insurance forms back in the States, uh, the insurance companies say, you know, we're not responsible for acts of God. And you know what they're referring to? Catastrophes and calamities and earthquakes and storms, and they call them acts of God. God is good. Now, granted, God is sovereign, and sometimes the devil can only do what God allows him to do because he has to reel out his leash so to speak. There are limits on what the devil can do. But this planet really has been kidnapped by the enemy. How did the devil get control of this world? It's in the Bible. Number seven, when God created Adam and Eve, what one thing did he forbid them to do? Now because the devil was roaming with his angels through the universe trying to spread the rebellion among the other intelligent creatures, God said I'm going to limit Satan's influence so he doesn't just harass everybody and the only place that he could meet with the creatures was by this tree and on this earth there was a tree a forbidden tree and God says you've got complete freedom to Adam and Eve in this world just don't eat from that tree don't touch the fruit everything will be well well one day Eve was out wandering by herself oh I'm getting ahead of myself when God created Adam and Eve, what one thing did he forbid them to do? Let me read this. But of the knowledge of the good, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, it says, you shall die. He told them, don't. Go by that tree. Well, what happened? It tells us in the Bible that um, 
Eve was evidently wandering around in the garden and examining the fruit or doing some harvesting and she saw that tree and maybe it was a beautiful tree probably was sin usually is probably had neon lights or something I don't know and as she drew near the tree all of a sudden the devil had evidently you know God can possess people the devil can possess people God has spoken through donkeys the devil can speak through animals too and the devil took this serpent, which was one of the most hypnotic of all the creatures in the garden. Evidently, it could fly before. And that's where you get all these legends of the winged serpents. All cultures seem to, to bear that out. And Eve came and saw this beautifully da How many of you ladies think snakes are beautiful? <laughs> Not too many. Come on. Have you seen some of their patterns? We got a serpentarium in Miami where they got snakes from all over the world. And boy, some of them are dazzling. And you see them move, and it's almost hypnotic. Even Solomon said, one of the mysteries is uh, the way a serpent moves. Cold-blooded. And that serpent was up there in the tree. And perhaps he was eating the fruit. As if to say, look, nothing's wrong with me. As a matter of fact, before I ate this fruit, I couldn't even talk. Now look what it's done for me. Hey, beautiful, come here for a minute. I want to talk to you. <laughs> that usually works. <laughs> and she drew near out of curiosity. And um, he said, has God said you're not supposed to eat from the trees? Oh, no, we can eat from all the trees, but we're just not supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what was that fruit? Who knows? People say it was an apple. Have you heard that before? When, you know, when she ate the apple and then gave the apple to Adam. And I think apples get a bad rap. <laughs> it could have been a banana. It doesn't tell us what it was. It just says we don't know exactly what it looks like. And what do you guys call this? my throat. No, it's an Adam's apple, right? Because when Adam ate it, it got stuck right there. <laughs> I got all these rumors about what the fruit was. I know what the fruit was. Chocolate. <laughs> it's because women find it irresistible. <laughs> and so she ate this forbidden fruit and then brought it to her husband and that's when sin came into the world. Now, I've run ahead of my questions here. What medium did Satan use to deceive Eve, and what lies did he tell her? Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Genesis 3, verse 1. And then the serpent said to the woman, you won't really die. Now, notice this. God told Adam and Eve very clearly, if you eat the forbidden fruit, you will die. The devil is completely contradicting the word of God. By the way, the first question in the Bible is the devil questioning the Word of God. You know why we've got so many problems in the world today? It's because the devil is still getting people to question the Word of God. It all came from doubting God's Word. And then after that, man lost dominion of the planet. Keep in mind, when God first made Adam and Eve, God made man in his own image. In the same way that God is supreme and a ruler and God can create, God made man so he has the ability to procreate and man was to be the ruler of this world. The minion of the planet was given to Adam, the highest of all God's creatures. The crowning act of creation was man and woman. And when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the word of the enemy instead of the word of God, they basically handed the keys of this planet to Satan. We lost control. Even Jesus says the devil is the prince of this world. So you are living in a planet that is a war zone. You can see it around you all the time. And instead of saying, why do so many bad things happen, we ought to be thanking the Lord that so many good things happen. God intervenes a great deal to protect, but there are limits based on his own character and justice on what he can do in this world except as we ask him through prayer to intervene in our lives. There's a cosmic conflict transpiring down here. Serpent said, you won't really die. And he went on. It says, so the dragon was cast out, that old serpent of old called the devil and Satan. There again, Genesis, you've got the serpent is the devil. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, you've got the serpent, which is the devil. And then there's a prophecy made in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God said after Adam and Eve sinned, you know, God asked Adam, what did you do? And he blamed his wife. He said, it's the woman you gave me. 
And God said to the woman, what did you do? And she said, oh, it's a serpent you made. And then God asked the serpent, what did you do? And he didn't have a leg to stand on. There's nothing left. <laughs> and so then there was a curse that came. And God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Seed means descendants, offspring. There are two seeds in the world, two groups, the children of God, the sons of God, and the daughters of men. You've got the sons of God, the children of God. Behold what manner of law, love the fathers bestowed on us. This is 1 John chapter 3, that we should be called the sons of God. When you believe in the Lord, you are adopted into the family of Christ. You become sons and daughters of God. There's two groups, saved and the lost. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. Only two groups in this world, friends. And that's why there's this battle raging. You know what the battle is for? Loyalty. The devil is campaigning for your lives, and he gets it by getting you to sin. Every time we sin, we're basically saying, I'm voting for the devil. But God knows that a lot of this is happening because our natures have fallen. You see, when, when God first made Adam, he was perfect. Adam did not have the temptations you and I have. Adam's internal motivation was love for God. Some of you, have you ever bought a computer, a new computer? That computer comes from the factory with certain hardware pre-installed. Adam, as he came from the hands of God, he didn't have to teach him how to talk. He knew how to talk. He came hardwired with certain knowledge. And one of the things Adam had right from the factory was he was motivated by love for God. You see, sin and is selfishness. Sin is like a compass needle that always points towards self. And after Adam fell, it just affected his very DNA. And every child of Adam, all of us, all the descendants of humans in the world, are all naturally we've got a virus, a computer virus. It's called selfishness. Instead of being motivated by love for God and love for others, we turn it upside down and we come first. All we think about is, what will this mean for me? What will this do for me? What about this and that? And our prayers are even full of selfishness. When you get a new heart, God begins to transform us. So all of a sudden, we, we start thinking outside of ourselves, start loving God and loving others. And that's a miracle operation we all need. We become new creatures through the Lord's power. It goes on to say in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. We just talked about the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3. Here it talks about it again in Revelation now. It's a central theme of prophecy in the Bible. The dragon, who's the dragon? We're learning what these symbols mean. Was wroth, angry, with the woman. Who's the woman? That'd be God's church. And he goes to make war with the remnant, that means the remainder of her seed, or her descendants, her children. And so there's this war going on. Now, here's the good news. It's like kind of a political campaign. The devil has cast his vote against you. He wants you to be destroyed. The devil hates you. And you might be wondering, why does the devil hate me so much? It's because he hates God. And he wants to hurt God by hurting you. Because the devil knows that God loves you. I want to ask you, parents, what would hurt you more if someone tortured you or made you watch as they tortured your child? What would hurt more? We have five children, had six, we lost a son. I know what it looks like to see a child in the hospital suffering. And, uh, is, uh, oh, if you could trade places and say, Lord, let it be me. I'd rather suffer than watch them suffer. God loves us more than you love your children. And the devil, even though he doesn't love, he's seen it before. He's been around a long time. And he knows how it pains God to hurt you. And so he vents his anger on God by hurting God's children. God made this beautiful world. The devil tries to corrupt it because it all hurts God. And while we're down here shaking our fist at God, saying, if you're so good, why are you allowing all this? And God is saying, this hurts me much more than it hurts you. That's why Jesus came, to show us what God is like. Jesus came to show us what his Father is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus came to be our substitute, our example, and our substitute to take our place. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, 
and goes to destroy the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. You know, it's an interesting prophecy in Mark 16. Jesus said when the disciples went out, he said, you will take up serpents. What do you think he meant by that? The disciples are to go around and start beating up snakes? What does that serpent represent? It simply means you will take on the devil. And they did. You know, there's some Christians out there that go picking up snakes and they think that's how they show their faith in God. Number nine, why was eating a piece of fruit such a deadly offense and why were Adam and Eve removed from the garden? He that commits sin is of the devil. John 3 verse 8. When a person sins, they are listening to the enemy and basically they were casting their vote on the side of the devil. And again, Romans chapter 6 verse 16. Don't you know that who you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves who you obey. Whoever you obey, that's whose servant you are. Whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So whose servant do you want to be? By the way, whether you want to or not, whether you believe it or not, you are all somebody's servant. We are all either serving God or the enemy. Well, I started telling you a minute ago, it's like a political campaign. The devil's cast his vote against you. God has cast his vote for you. You have the tie-breaking vote. You do. You have a free choice. Who you want to serve. Number 10. What are some of Satan's methods to hurt, deceive, discourage, and destroy people? You can read in uh, Revelation 12, verse 9. I'll go through a little alphabet of answers. Satan, who deceives the whole world, he uses deception. Keep in mind, deception is the commingling or mixing of truth and error. If I say, come on over, I've got, uh, you know, a fruit drink I want you to have. It's 99% orange juice. It's only 1% strychnine. Is it good? Well, 99%. Would you drink it? Well, that's what the devil does. He mixes a lot of good in with something toxic. And that's how virtually every religion in the world has some truth. I mean, if it was all lies, who would believe it? Right? There's got to be some truth, and that's what the devil does. He attracts people with those elements. Again, in Mark 1.13, it says, Jesus was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan. So he deceives, he tempts. He tries to destroy us by tempting us to sin, tries to separate us by God, or separate us from God by sin. Sin separates. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from ourselves and sin separates us from each other and he tries to enslave and manipulate people to do his will in this great battle against God and his forces answer C it says they're the spirits of devils working miracles now how often have you heard someone say before I didn't mean to the devil made me do it have you heard that before the devil made me do it well, you know, the devil is not God. He's not omnipresent. He's not all-powerful. Most of the time when you and I sin, the devil is operating through fallen angels. The same way God has angels that guard and protect you, the devil's got his fallen angels. They're typically called demons, devils, gremlins, ghosts. I mean, they have a thousand different ways that they could be defined, but they are these evil spirits the Bible speaks of. They're very real. And, and don't you know, I don't want you to think I'm superstitious and I go around all the time wondering where all the angels are. But they're very real, friends. And um, you've probably seen some of the forces or felt them in your life. I can guarantee that you have, whether you recognize it or not. I quoted this tonight, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So don't be surprised if his messengers are transformed into ministers of darkness. Again, Jesus warned us, beware of false prophets that come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Someone asked, why are there so many different churches out there? Paul warned, he said, after my departure, the Apostle Paul, grievous wolves will enter into the flock, not sparing the flock, to draw away disciples after themselves. One reason there are so many different denominations is because different religious leaders wanted to get their followers. And so they put down all the others and they said, you've got to follow me. I've got the only answer. And that's uh, one way that things have gotten so fractioned. Revelation 13, 13. It says, the devil can do great wonders 
so that he makes fire come down from heaven upon the earth in the sight of men to deceive. You remember the story in the Bible, uh, even if you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments. By the way, my mom was in that movie. She was an actress. Very small part. You have to look real quick. I say, there she is. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Moses throws down his serpent to prove the power of God is with him. And what do the magicians of Pharaoh do? Ah, we can do that. They throw down, uh, Moses throws down his rod. I'm sorry. It turns into a serpent. You all remember that? And then the magicians throw down their rods, their staffs, and they turn into serpents. But Moses ate theirs. God's power is greater. The devil counterfeits. He can perform signs and wonders and miracles. Furthermore, he's called the accuser of the brethren. The devil will tell you to do something and then he'll turn you in for doing it. He'll tempt you to sin and then he'll shake his fist at God and say, they say they love you. You can find examples of that in, in the uh, book of Zechariah where the devil is accusing the high priest of his filthy garments. He's called the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God day and night. And when God said, have you considered my servant Job? The devil said, oh, the only reason he serves you is because you protected him. Answer E, the devil is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of it. So the devil has no problem killing. He is heartless, cold-blooded. It doesn't matter if it's innocent children. He has no mercy. Number 11, how powerful and effective are Satan's temptations and strategies? Well, I don't want to give him any glory, but the Bible tells us that we should be aware of our enemy. Matthew 24, 24, there will be false Christs and false prophets that will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. It says, the devil who deceiveth the whole world. In the last days, his deceptions are going to be so compelling that the vast majority of the world is going to follow him. That's why I'm glad that you're here and listening. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Most people follow the devil. They don't, and he's not running around with a red leotards and a goatee and horns. I mean, who would follow him? The devil is a smooth operator. He makes sin as attractive as he can. He's a master of marketing his philosophy. Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, be on your guard, because your adversary, the devil, is going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. He is, and he's sneaky. Lions use stealth when they capture their prey. There are three principal areas where the devil tempts us. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's of the world. And the world's going to pass away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. In the temptation of Jesus, he was tempted those three areas of sin, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember, the devil said to Christ, if you're the Son of God, take these stones and turn them into bread, tempting his physical temptations. And Jesus answered with the Bible. He said, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Or I'm sorry, he took him up to the um, pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. And then the devil quotes the Bible. For it is written, he'll give his angels charge over thee, and they'll bear you up in your hands lest you dash your foot against the stone. Does the devil know the Bible? So does he misquote it? Should it surprise you that there are a lot of different religions out there that claim to believe the Bible, but they misquote it? And he did it even to Jesus. He still does it today. Third temptation. He took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said, all these things I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. What does the devil want? He wants to be God. He wanted to subjugate Christ. He wants that position. It's very clear what he wants. And Jesus said, and by the way, there's that verse. I ran ahead again. Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Notice all three times that Jesus fought temptation, he used weapons that are available to you and me. He used the Bible. So what is our best defense? 
Remember we found out this represents the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. As you hide His Word in your heart, it gives you strength against temptation. That's why it's so important for us to study and read the Bible. It tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God has provided a way for you to be victorious over every temptation. You know, when I came to the Lord, uh, the first time I was drinking and smoking and using drugs and had all kinds of addictions and problems, and by the grace of God, He saved me from the, the alcohol, the cigarettes, the drugs, the um, immorality, bad language. Oh, I had a bad mouth. That to me is one of the biggest miracles of all. He gave me a new vocabulary. You haven't heard me slip once, have you? It's just he reprogramming. and he'll do that for you. He makes you a new creature. In our own power, we can't defeat the devil. But through Christ, all things are possible. Again, I already mentioned this. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Now I've got to race along here. James chapter 4, verse 7. How do we overcome? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. You come to Him just like you are. Resist the devil. You use what natural strength God has given you to resist his temptation. He's given you all a will to choose. Choose to resist him. Submit to God. It says if, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. If you resist the devil, he will flee from you. When Satan was resisted by Jesus, he left him. And so, yes, you can get the victory because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When and where will the devil receive his final punishment? God says in Revelation, depart from me. He says to the devil, depart into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation talks about a lake of fire where Satan and his fallen angels will ultimately be executed. They're going to receive their punishment. And again, speaking of the devil, Ezekiel 28, 18, I will bring you to ashes on the earth in the sight of them that behold you. It says, the devil is going to be consumed, to be cast into this lake of fire. Number 13, what is it that forever settles the horrible problem of sin, and will sin ever rise up again? You can read in the book Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9, affliction or sin will not rise up again the second time. You might be thinking, once the devil's gone, how do we know this will never happen again? The whole universe has observed this great conflict between good and evil here on this planet. Nobody is ever going to forget. And forever in the hands of Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he still had the scars. As a reminder of what the terrible punishment of sin is, the terrible consequences of sin, he suffered for that. Nobody's going to want to experiment with selfishness ever again. It says in Zechariah 13, verse 6, And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in your hands? It's where he was wounded for us because he loves us. He took our punishment so that we could be forgiven and saved. But you must accept it. He won't force your will. He cannot force love. You choose to. Number 14, who makes the final, complete eradication of sin from the universe a certainty? 1 John 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Who's the Son of God? Jesus. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's why you've got to let him destroy those things in you. He will. He'll make you a new creature. The whole world that follows the devil, it will be destroyed. He destroys the power of the devil over you. If you trust him, he'll give you all the armor that you need to survive in these last days. And again, Hebrews 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, also himself likewise took the part of the same, that through death Jesus might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. You don't have to be afraid of death. Through Christ, because he died and rose again, you can have a new body, you can rise again, you can live forever. Because what Jesus did, he destroyed the power of the devil. You know, even the Bible says in Revelation, even death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth where everything is perfect. How does God the Father feel about people? The Bible says the Father himself loves you. God loves you. God so loved the world, he gave his son. It's not like Jesus is there saying, please, Father, don't destroy them. God the Father loves you. God the Son loves you. You've got heaven on your side. 
you are caught up in a battle right now you weren't asked to be but Jesus like your Moses is offering you a way to go to the promised land and beyond that he has laid down his life to save you he's doing everything he can that you might live forever you know this verse for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life you know I want to raise a hand because I see him out of time I want to close with a little story here now you've got crocodiles in Australia North America we got alligators they look a lot alike to me but they are different especially in Florida where I used to live they've got a lot of alligators and they're proliferating down there because they're protected and they're multiplying everywhere now and one day a, a mother that lived out in the, uh, the back part of southern Florida with her son they had a big big pond small lake on their property one day their son said mama it's a hot day I want to go jump in the pond they had a little dock a little beach there on their their lake by the pond and he was she said okay real quick and then come in for lunch true story he went running out he didn't even wait till he got to the shore he just ripping off his clothes down to his bathing suit got to the edge of the water and he jumped in mom is watching dutifully from the kitchen window where she can see the pond where he's swimming there and evidently a very large alligator had migrated to that pond they didn't had never been there before and she saw that as her son was swimming out towards the middle this big gator slip into the water on the other side and begin swimming towards her son she dropped her dishes and ran out the door and she began to scream alligator alligator swim for the shore there's an alligator well he knew what that meant and he turned around he's looking all around and he began to swim with all his might and the gator was closing on him pretty quick she's running down towards the shore just as he got up towards the shore the gator chomped down on his legs the same time the mother lunged she grabbed his wrists and then there was a tug of war and at first the gator's pulling mom off in the water but you know mothers are pretty tenacious and she's pulling back and her son is slippery and slipped out of her hand she grabbed him again and he's yelling don't let go don't let go and the gator's trying to pull him back and do this roll she pulled him back up on shore well all this screaming and commotion the mother and the son a farmer driving by right near the house heard that he paused he looked he had a rifle in his truck grabbed the rifle ran down there shot the alligator well the boy was badly scarred uh, on his legs and he was taken to the hospital and at first they thought he was going to lose his legs but the doctors did a remarkable job and they patched him up so that he kept his legs after he recovered a little bit a reporter came to the hospital and asked if he could interview the boy and find out what his ordeal was like and, and get the story and he said do you mind if I see your legs he said no and he pulled back the sheets and he showed him the legs and the, the bandages were off and he could see the stitches and the scars and and the boy then held up his arms and he said you know and I got scars on my arms too because mom wouldn't let go of me and he was so proud of the scars on his arms well you know somebody's got scars in their hands because he didn't want to let go of you and that's Jesus but you've got to make a decision to hang on to him he says I'll not let go of you but you've got to come to me he will not force himself on you he will not force his love on you he pleads with you to come just as you are and he says he'll give you a new life he'll give you a victory he'll give you a purpose he says it's an abundant life you know this seminar is about prophecy we're wanting to get you to get the big picture but we can't separate the plan of salvation from prophecy it's all that's the central theme of prophecy it's about Jesus and as we close this session I'd just like to ask once again if you'd like to say Lord I want to come to you just like I am and Pastor Doug will you pray for me that uh, God will be real in my life and that he'll show me that he's there that he'll work miracles in my life if that's your desire let's stand together and we'll ask for God's blessing as we close dear father Lord our hearts are stirred as we think about the love of God that was demonstrated at the cross in that Jesus gave his life and and that you would give your son father that's a lot of love we can also see in the world around us the the ruthless brutality of this hideous villain the devil we know he's very alive and very real in this world and 
Without your power, we're easy targets, Lord, but we know that through Christ we can do all things. We pray that as we come to Jesus that you will place around each of us a shield of angels. Protect us on every side. Give us that armor, Lord. And most of all, I pray we can fortify our minds with the truth of your word, that we can have the tools to resist temptation. Send your spirit into our lives, Lord. We know that in the same way that light displaces darkness, as the light of Jesus comes in our hearts, it will expel the devil. So send that light right now, Lord, into the hearts of all these people. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their health. And give us traveling mercies as we go from this place. And again, we pray you bring us back tomorrow evening as we continue studying your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.